This uh, topic is the mega project topic uh, that we will take advantage of the fact that the reading does an excellent job of bridging the territories that we've just covered in this, this last discussion between starting with colonialism and this oppressive political relationship with the rest of the world, uh, moving through the idea of world systems being the most important mechanism of organizing, the most influential mechanisms of organizing uh, architecture as an instrument of uh, identity construction around the world into the period of national identity construction and then into the period of the mega project. The author Abed and Kusno uh, wrote a piece that was published in a book last September. Um, I had the privilege of helping him work through some of the issues of this chapter um, at the very end when we in a panic to put this book together, called him up and said, please, can we have a chapter from you? And he, he provided this brilliant chapter um, that does this, this important job of connecting these difficult links. So it's a perfect reading to, um, for this moment in the course and in the semester to help us make a very direct connection between colonialism to uh, independent status of these new nation states and their job of, of constructing an identity and then directly into uh, triumphal capitalism and the competition between different emerging economies in the present context of, of Asia. Uh, and so Kusno starts deep in the, he refers back deeply in the colonial period of Indonesia. He is Indonesian. Uh, and one of the greatest uh, scholars of this topic uh, to come out of Indonesia. Uh, he's at, in Vancouver, British Columbia, um, teaching there. But he starts by looking at uh, the colonial project and how it was very important for the Dutch East Indies to develop a sense of autonomy from the Dutch uh, nation and to start to develop uh, technical professionals, and so they developed an institute of technology modeled after MIT in the city of Bandung. One of the first graduates of that course was a young architect by the name of Sukarno. And in 1942, when the Japanese came in and colonized Indonesia, uh, Sukarno uh, was one of the leaders of the revolution. He became the first president of Indonesia, and uh, and as a true architect, modernist architect, upon independence in 1949, he set about to reconstruct the capital city of Batavia as Jakarta, where Paul is from, uh, as a symbol not just of Indonesia, but of all newly independent countries in the world. In the 1950s, there was something called the Asia-Africa Conference in the city of Bandung, where the Bandung Institute of Technology is. And all of the newly emancipated former colonies got together and said, listen, this world needs to be more about the competition between the two superpowers, the United States of America and the Soviet Union. We need a third path. And so they declared the birth of the third world. It was the third path. The first world is the capitalist nations, uh, the victorious allies um, of the West after World War II. The second world were the nations, states under the model of state socialism, uh, the Soviet Union, China being the two biggest of those, uh, but spreading through the Cold War competition, spreading to uh, Vietnam and elsewhere uh, during the Cold War years. And then the third, uh, as the United States and the Soviet Union competed for the hearts and minds of all these different people, the third world declared uh, a rejection against both the first and the second world and said, we are the new beacon of hope for humanity. We will not submit ourselves to domination by either the United States or the Soviet Union. And so this is the configuration of the globe after World War II in the 1950s and the 1960s. And Indonesia, under President Sukarno, 
President Sukarno was both a leader of the Third World Movement, the non-aligned movement, and a modernist architect. And so he, he proceeds to construct a new city using the vocabulary of modern architecture to declare the dominance uh, of the Third World nations, that they are the true beacon of hope for humanity. This is the physical manifestation of his beacon. I guess I can't use the pointer. But pretend that I'm pointing at that tower. Now, this is simultaneously a modern version of the traditional Javanese, the Hindu Javanese worldview of the linga and yoni, the male and female genitalia, which order the cosmos. And so he's doing multiple things at the same time. He is invoking traditional Javanese symbols. He is using the language of modern architecture to create a universal humanism at the same time. So he is pulling, uh, he's doing what architecture does. He's taking two irreconcilable conditions, the universal modernism of Echoshard and the specific modernism of Lyotet, uh, referring back to Rabineau's writing about French Morocco. And he's reconciling them in a single set of forms. And so uh, the city of Jakarta is reconstructed uh, as this instrument for leading the world into this glorious new age, uh, transcending the dominance of the first and the third, first and the second world, the Soviets and capitalism. And so the construction of Jakarta is all about creating this beacon of the world. And he actually goes so far as to redraw the map of the world, taking the zero meridian out of Greenwich, England, and moving it to bisect this tower. And so this is the new zero meridian. This is the new center of the world. Uh, and, and it's kind of like the palaces of ancient Java, for those of you who were in that class last semester, about this is the point where all good fortune flows from heaven into earth and out to uh, the emerging countries. Uh, this is one of the images that Kusno did not include in his uh, chapter, um, the Jakarta Tower, um, the early. And here we see um, President Sukarno with the sunglasses and the hat and his architects all excited about the uh, deployment of these modernist buildings, in this case a hotel uh, that, would attract, that would help place Jakarta on the world stage as a tourist destination. And the axial <coughs> streets that um, would also be the axes of power uh, of this city. Um, the welcome monument at the Bundaran Ha'i, Hotel Indonesia roundabout, uh, under siege during the, uh, the violence of 1965. The flaming pizza guy, what's his real name? I've always known him as the pizza man. Okay, <laughs> the pizza delivery man. But the deployment of Soviet realist symbolism yeah. and Soviet uh, uh, the, Sukarno tried to establish a competition between multiple factions and to foment a continuous and ongoing revolution. Interestingly enough, um, well, in 1965, uh, there was a, a coup attempt and, and a shuffle for power. Basically, the United States was uncomfortable with how closely Sukarno was associating with the communist um, movement in Indonesia. And so uh, through a very sloppy transition, uh, Suharto, General Suharto became the new military dictator of Indonesia. And in the pro as soon after coming into power, um, he organized a purge that killed somewhere between uh, 400,000 and 600,000, or maybe a million people. Um, whole villages that associated with the Communist Party where all the men were killed and thrown into the rivers. Um, I have friends who still remember these events, and some people are still um, not allowed to hold teaching positions because they were intellectuals in the early Communist Party uh, in Indonesia. Anyway, Suharto became 
the new president in 1966, and one of the first monuments he built was the highway cloverleaf uh, as a symbol of Indonesia's arrival on the modern stage. Even though the highways connected to it were underdeveloped, the cloverleaf was there as a symbol. And the skyline uh, emerged after that. So we leave Indonesia, and we move to Malaysia, where Malaysia was a British colony. They uh, have a, a difficult ethnic national identity challenge because uh, the Chinese minority are the dominant economic players, and the native Malaysians uh, who feel they have uh, a God-given right to the inheritance of the wealth of the nation uh, feel themselves at a distinct disadvantage to the economic dominance of the Chinese. And so the formation of the nation state was very much engineered by creating advantages, almost like affirmative action programs for native Malays. And so business, uh, government contracts would be given to uh, Malay-owned companies instead of Chinese-owned companies. Um, and there was a, a big and long and ongoing struggle uh, to try to negotiate this racial tension and economic and class tension in Malaysia. At the same time, they were trying to chart their own course very much in the spirit of the non-aligned movement that started in Bandung in the 50s. Uh, and they wanted to um, shirk the uh, label of less developed or developing country, and they set as their goal under Mahathir, the, the um, prime minister of Malaysia, for uh, several decades. Um, the important dictators uh, of this era are Suharto in Indonesia, Mahathir in Malaysia, Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore, and uh, Ferdinand Marcos in the Philippines. Uh, each of them enjoyed dominance for several decades during this period, and each of them tried to use architecture and urban form to promote national identity construction programs. Mahathir, uh, in a way, gives us the most uh, vivid and dramatic example uh, through his architectural deployments uh, that's on the right, you see the Petronas Tower for a brief moment in the 90s, uh, the tallest buildings in the world. Um, but common throughout this region is this idea of um, modernity and modernization. Um, Kusno in the reading does a great job of, I think it's a great job, uh, you, you will probably find his language to be difficult and impenetrable but um, try to read into what he is saying, the scenario that um, kind of a psychological situation of each of these countries. These countries used to be colonial uh, occupied states. And uh, so they, when they become independent, how do you establish your, your dignity and your identity on the global stage uh, both for your citizens and for citizens of the world, uh, because you were dominated. You were the little people. You were the slaves of the dominant Western culture. So how do you establish yourself as equals on the global stage? Well, you do it through architecture. Um, one of the big radical debates during the colonial period was, uh, can the native people develop? And the answer for most of the colonial period was no. You need to draw a line around native villages, keep them the way they are, the noble savages, and uh, keep them underdeveloped, and then establish cities around those native indigenous zones and develop those areas for an international population and those few natives that are capable of crossing the boundary and to participate with the developed world. Um, the radical thing that happened during colonialism was to suggest that native populations were capable of development and they can uh, be educated and they can be prepared for the eventual rising up of this ladder, this imagined ladder where we go from underdeveloped to developing to developed. 
And this is a big thing that we take for granted. But uh, in this class and through this reading, it's important to not take it for granted. This is a cultural construct, if ever there was one, that peoples move through this, this sequence of steps from undeveloped to underdeveloped to developing to developed. And the world system literature that we looked at two weeks ago suggests that, or last week, suggests that uh, the world system counts and operates capitalism. The origins of the world system theory was a critique of capitalism, that by constantly dangling the prospect in front of the peasants of the world, you will be developed someday, just not yet. But play your cards right, and you can move up the ladder. And so you have a majority of the world's population uh, watching TV uh, that's produced in the United States, watching advertisement, drinking Coca-Cola, thinking, ah, the good life is on, my, on its way. I will soon be able to join the rest of the world in driving cars, uh, uh, having cell phones, check, they actually do that, uh, refrigerators, um, disposable income, participation, full participation, in the consumer economy of the world, and, uh, and I just have to be patient. And rulers of countries say, just be patient, it's coming. And Mahathir is one of these rulers. Um, but the game, the shell game, the bait and switch trick, the dirty trick of capitalism, is to say, not yet. It's not time yet. And the, the brilliant thing that Wallerstein pointed out in his establishment of world system theory is that, and this relates back to what I mentioned about, uh, what's the name of the movie? Avatar. How does the world economy work? What did Marx say about capitalism? Capitalism only works when there is surplus labor. You need a huge labor pool to keep wages low so that uh, the value of that labor can be exploited. You can extract the value of the labor on the market and pay workers less than the value of their labor. So it is only through exploitation that profit can occur. Profit only occurs when you pay someone less than what their time is worth. That's the basic theory of Marxism. Wallerstein, building on that, said we always need a pool of labor that where there's competition for these jobs, for these low-paying jobs, and if we ever run out of labor, their wages will go up too high and we won't be able to extract our profits. And so we go from New England, we go from England to New England. We undercut their prices by, by working for less. Lawrence, Massachusetts was a beautiful model because they said, we're going to employ uh, teenage young women and women in their 20s. And those are the only people we're going to employ because they're a docile workforce. They're dependable. They're disciplined. We can control them. We can move them between the factory and the boarding house and back into the church. And we can control this population. It was a brilliant formula for undercutting the wages of British companies. Well, it, held, it worked beautifully for decades, but then uh, the American Southwest, so uh, what became the new hot place to move manufacturing. So it went from New England to Arizona, from Arizona to Mexico, from Mexico to China and Japan, China and Japan to Vietnam and Malaysia, and now these labor costs uh, are too high, so we're moving to Africa. Uh, and the next place after Africa are refugee camps. So the new Asia is Africa, and then after that, the new Asia will be refugee camps because, and then prisons, and that's already happening. Prisons in the United States is the new uh, deep pool of low-cost labor. And so the world system theory holds that capitalism will never give up on maintaining its deep pool of labor. Uh, it will always resist that uh, the development of these populations because we depend so much 
on deep pools of cheap labor. So Mahathir said, uh, against that, Mahathir says, no, we're going to accelerate this process. We are not going to become, we are not going to be the cheap pool of labor. We are going to be, we are going to out America, even America. And so they are, they head out on a journey of rapid development to the, the goal he announced in the, at the end of the 1980s was that Malaysia was going to be declared an official developed country by 2020. And so this was called the Vision 2020. The goal was to develop Kuala Lumpur that you see in the background in the upper left, uh, to, and connect it on a 50 kilometer long corridor with uh, a new airport to the, to the south. And along that corridor would be a brand new it was called the Multimedia Super Corridor because it was a corridor uh, geographically. Um, this is a picture of a typical Malaysian city. Um, so it was a corridor, it was super, and it was multimedia because in the late 80s, multimedia was the cool thing. So it stuck with that name, even though none of us can relate to the name multimedia anymore, we're stuck with that name. Um, in Penang, Malaysia, they wanted to preserve the historic British uh, city of Chinese shop houses. These houses that you see in the foreground are very much uh, coming directly out of the Lilong tradition uh, that we talked about on Tuesday um, from the Chinese community uh, of Penang, Malaysia. And in order to preserve that, they built a single huge skyscraper to add office space without having to demolish the Chinese shop houses. So this was the tallest building on the Pacific Rim uh, for a few moments in the 1980s. Um, and this is what it kind of looks like from the traditional shop house, Lilong style streets of Penang. Uh, here we have our uh, Palace of Justice building in the Indo-Saracenic style in Kuala Lumpur. And we have uh, in the 1990s, we have Caesar Paley from New Haven, Connecticut, uh, designing a skyscraper. And in a way, this is the quintessential demonstration of taking symbolism from Islam, because Malaysia is a uh, heavily uh, Islamic uh, culture, uh, and its national identity is largely constructed around the idea of Islam. It's also a petroleum-producing nation. And so this is the national petroleum company, Petronas, uh, building these twin towers designed by Cesar Peli and using uh, an Islamic motif in the diagram of the, of the plan and just replicating and developing that, that floor plan up into a tower. Um, it's actually quite uh, beautifully done. Um, and since the two towers sway in relationship to each other under lateral loading, it was a very interesting structural problem to create a bridge that would float between the two towers even as they moved independently of each other. And so that's how you get this configuration. Um, quite a beautiful building, actually. The airport, um, these are too small. Um, Malaysian modernism, very much a part of this, uh, trying to create modern buildings, but employing, uh, like we said earlier, the, the elements of uh, Islam, but not Islam from Asia, Islam from the Middle East. A very interesting um, hybridization going on, too small. But these, in the town planning, these evocations of uh, high-rise downtowns and low-rise um, Silicon Valley-like housing on the outskirts. When I was there in 94, um, there was a lot of hoopla around uh, the new capital of the parliament uh, in Putrajaya, um, which was a complete new town built from scratch, and Cyberjaya, Again, you see the deployment of these words, cyber and multimedia, to invoke a forward-looking uh, new citizenry of Malaysia. Basically, Mahathir used architecture and urban form and the high-speed rail that connected 
uh, the multimedia super corridor together, um, Mahathir was using architecture to design the ideal Malaysian citizen of the future. The ideal Malaysian citizen of the future uh, is very strong in math and science. They go to engineering college and they become technical professionals in the 21st century. Even if there is no single person in Malaysia that fits this, uh, this uh, normal ideal uh, Malaysian citizen exactly, um, it still is a very important reference point. They will live in houses that come uh, that seem to be designed in Palo Alto because Silicon Valley was the model. And so um, there's a big uh, promotional center, an exhibition center, promoting these ideas of the new Malaysian citizen using architecture and urban form. Uh, here's the airport. Uh, here's more from the exhibition pavilion. Um, here's a map uh, in the exhibition uh, showing the relationship between the airport in the south, Kuala Lumpur, the redeveloped um, uh, capital of the nation, and the multimedia super corridor development concept, including Putrajaya and Cyberjaya, the twin cities. One is the seat of, of government. The other is the uh, Silicon Valley of Southeast Asia. And we see representations of it like this. Um, and the control center, the hub uh, of controlling the city through technology, um, all of these maps, uh, these architectural images to uh, make sure that it can attract uh, the Silicon Valley int intellectuals, the information uh, professionals, uh, deploying the symbolism of, of a modern Islamic uh, nation state um, through all these forms. And it's very suburban, very much based on an American model, um, even. But then, and I kept passing signs on the highway saying 14 kilometers to uh, Putrajaya, seven kilometers to Putrajaya, turn left here, exit here to go to Putrajaya. And my taxi driver and I, this is where we ended up. So here's Putrajaya. It's, at the time, it was just a mythical place. Um, we eventually found a pile of dirt and some bulldozers moving it around. But all of these images were created by architects and planners long before it ever uh, was built. So architecture and planning imagery was doing its job of constructing a new image of the nation state long before there was anything actually to experience on the ground.